Hello, everyone. Thank you for your participants in the Global Digital Salon. Today, we would like to ask Daniel Kotoke-san to share his memories of Steve Jobs. Hi, Daniel. Please come in. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for coming. <laughs> And uh, let's, let, let me start your interview. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, as you know, Steve Jobs' 2005 Stanford Commencement Address, the world's best presentation. Today, we will highlight the deep meaning behind this each word. The world's most important Seventeen years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were spent on the college. I have no idea what I want to do. Historical, historical, 
artistically subtle in the way that songs are kind of captured. And I found it fascinating. None of this had given up hope of any practical application in the problem. Ten years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, we all came back to it. And we designed it all in the map. It was the first computer with beautiful technology. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, Mac would have never had multiple type pieces of proportionally spaced maps. And since Windows just copied the map, it's likely that no person a computer would have one. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that kind of class. And personal computers might not have the wonderful technology that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots moving forward when I was in college. It was very, very clear looking back at this particular program. Again, you can't connect the dots that you follow. You can only connect them to the different documents. So you have to trust that the dots are somehow connecting with each other. You have to trust that something, the gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because the moment that the dots that connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart, even when it leads you off the well worn path, and not to make the right difference. The theme of the speech are three. Connecting the dots, love and loss, death, and stay hungry, stay foolish. Now I showed you the first part, connecting dots. Dansan, what do you remember when you see this video? Dansan, この映像を見てどんなことを思い出しましたか Was addressed to me, yes. Yes, yes. please. Go. You know, I don't think I ever saw that video before. Oh, really? I, but,、um, but I did read it. Yeah. And、uh, of course, I was very impressed. It、mm -hmm. is a magnificent talk,、mm -hmm. an all time classic. I did not find out until、oh. this year、mm -hmm. Steve didn't write that talk. You know who wrote it? <laughs> no, Mike, Michael Hawley wrote it.、Mm -hmm. And Michael Hawley himself just passed、mm -hmm. away two months ago.、Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned that he wrote it, because it was part of his, his obituary、mm -hmm. that he wrote the speech for Steve.、Yeah. He had worked for Steve at Next.、Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so because Steve was not really a writer. <laughs> that's right. That that's right. So, so now here's the question I would ask <laughs> of these themes that you mentioned the themes of connect the dots. Yeah. <laughs> I bet Steve didn't make it. I don't think he made that up. I think he took that from somewhere because that's how he, 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 he took whatever he liked. Yeah. <laughs> and love and death. Well,、oh. like that comes from Woody Allen, right? There was a famous love and death. That's、yeah. a universal theme. Wow. But、mm -hmm. that obviously was relevant because he had already had, and he was still living with Cam. He knew that.、Mm -hmm. So his days were numbered, more、mm -hmm. or less.、Mm -hmm. So, and that's a big theme of the talk. And what was the third? So, uh, connect the dots,、mm -hmm. love and death. What was the third theme? Anyway, I don't remember. Okay. So, the next question. Okay. So, you entered the Reed College in 1972. How did you become friends with Job? I know that in 1972, you were in the Reed College. Job was in the Reed College. Please talk. Well, I was in the Reed College. The very first day I arrived at Reed, I met another guy from New York who was very much like me. And he and I became friends on the、uh -huh. first day. His name was Lawrence Phillips.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, two weeks later, I ran into Lawrence and he、mm -hmm. said, Daniel,、mm -hmm. you should come over to my dorm and meet this guy, Steve.、Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. And that he was talking about Steve Jobs. Oh, really? <laughs> and,、uh, What's the first thing?、Uh, and Steve is the name. Yeah. What's the first impression of this? What's、Steve、that?、Club? 
your first impression. impression. Well, hmm. yes, so my very, my very first impression was he had an expensive Tiak, which I think oh. is Japanese. Right? <laughs> okay. He had an expensive Tiak, mm -hmm. eight inch reel to reel tape recorder. With oh yeah, many, yeah. Mm -hmm. Many many hours of Bob Dylan bootleg. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Steve was very proud of this. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. was not a Bob Dylan fan, so I didn't stick around to listen wow. to Bob Dylan. But yeah. um, that was a very expensive piece of gear for yeah, a college yeah. freshman who didn't yeah. have any money. <laughs> so I did yeah. not I did yeah. not actually be friends with Steve mm -hmm. until weeks later mm -hmm. but it was a small enough campus that i would see him around uh -huh. and he lived in this he lived in the same dorm as my friend lawrence so uh, the reason mm -hmm. the first reason we became friends is because i found this book called mm -hmm. be here now now at spiritualism mm -hmm. about Neem Karoli Baba and Baba Ramdas mm -hmm. and I had never seen anything like that book in my life mm -hmm. and I was carrying it around mm -hmm. wanting to talk to people about it and Steve mm -hmm. was one of the people who was interested to see it I probably yeah. loaned it to him yeah and that was the beginning of our friendship that yeah. book and yeah. of course we ended up going to yeah, two uh -huh. years later. Oh, interesting. So the next question. Did you walk uh, seven miles to Hare Krishna Temple? Is job every Sunday? Um, no, we didn't. Is that a map on the screen? That's very good ah, research. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is, that's too far to walk. We might have walked once. Yeah. yeah. But uh -huh. uh, we hitchhiked. Mm -hmm. We would hitchhike because there were enough cars driving, and it was the early 70s. You can't mm -hmm. really hitchhike nowadays, but in mm -hmm. those days, people would pick you up. <laughs> so Steve and I would hitchhike there. And oh, yeah. I, I, hitchhike. Yeah. Like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, we might have walked home, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. we liked the food. We liked yeah. the food very much, yeah, and yeah. it was free. Yeah. <laughs> and on that subject, since you're at, oh, good picture. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. is a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a picture of Ramdas, I think, with mm -hmm. Satsang. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I invite you to imagine mm -hmm. Steve Jobs at the Hare Krishna temple with these little symbols going ting, 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 <laughs> and chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Yeah, yeah. And I can tell you, it definitely happened. <laughs> it happened many times. Okay. So, uh, was, so uh, why did you go to Hare Krishna Temple? Uh, Hindu, Hindu like, uh, Temple. Uh, only for food. Why did Hindu go to Hare Krishna Temple? Just food? Well, yeah. Uh, well, I'm no, no, not only food if yeah. if it wasn't for the be here now book about uh, hindu it. spirituality mm -hmm. we might have gone once for an adventure yeah. but because we were then interested in the hindu culture and the hindu spirituality mm -hmm. that's what brought us back and then steve quick steve and i both became friends with dina bandhu mm -hmm. who was the head of that Hare krishna temple mm -hmm. and he was very smart and mm -hmm. friendly and so he was always encouraging us to come back we actually spent the night there once mm -hmm. yeah. okay the next question if, uh, okay. did you, yeah did you also um uh, return cook photo for the uh, five cent deposit to the high food wins no definitely <laughs> not now uh, yeah i'm not <laughs> When Steve said that, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think he was talking about his earlier years. Oh, yeah. I don't think he was returning book bottles when he was at yeah. Reed College. I see. At Reed, it was easy to get free food. 
because most students were on a meal plan in the mm -hmm. cafeteria, yeah. and all you had to do was go to the cafeteria, and people would give you food. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, people would give you free vegetarian food. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Did you go to Zen Center uh, and have a uh, eight free uh, vegetarian food? I thought that Zen Center de Muriel de Tay Kyo Sur Vegetarian Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which Zen Center you mean. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, Steve and I went several times, a couple of times a week, we went mm -hmm. to do Zazen meditation mm -hmm. oh, at the Los Altos mm -hmm. Zen Center. There was no food there, but they <laughs> might have uh, maybe some tea, maybe yeah. tea. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, now there was the big Zen center in San Francisco that I yeah. never visited, yeah. mm -hmm. and maybe Steve visited it. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then there was Tassajara Zen Center yeah. in Tassajara that had hot oh, springs, yeah, yeah. and uh, Steve and I would go there once a year. Yeah, it was a very long drive. Mm -hmm. And we we liked the food there, but it wasn't free. It was quite expensive. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, did you read uh, many Zen books in the prize library? And uh, I you know, I took some there. I found more Zen home. Did you read? Uh, uh, some, some I, mm -hmm. I would say uh, not many Zen books, mm -hmm. but uh, The Way of Zen by Alan Watts, I think, was the first one that I had. Mm -hmm. And I liked it very much. And Steve mm -hmm. read it also. Mm -hmm. And then I think Steve found Meditation in Action, yeah. which is not really Zen. That's Chogyam Trungpa, which is oh, yeah, Tibetan yeah. Buddhism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? I think so. Mm -hmm. But then uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Yes. Yeah. I would say it was Steve's all-time favorite book. I think I that was. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a book by uh, D. T. Suzuki about Zen. I forget what it was called, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, and I had other books. I yeah. liked reading about the Zen koans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very. It's very interesting. Uh, important information. Okay, then I will ask you. Did you read many vegetarian books in the college library? Too? Or, and was it the uh, uh, Why Jobs and You became vegetarian? Actually, what happened was mm -hmm. um, very, the very first thing mm -hmm. that Steve and I mm -hmm. ever talked about diet was mm -hmm. I was reading a copy of um, uh, the. Uh, what's it called? Um, not Zen Macrobiotics. Mm -hmm. All right. Zen mm -hmm. Macrobiotics. I forget the name of the author. Mm -hmm. He died of cancer, so it couldn't have been that great. Okay. But uh, Zen Macrobiotics was a well written book and it was very persuasive that all you needed to eat was brown rice. Mm -hmm. So Steve and I were both Zen Macrobiotics and eating brown rice every day. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing was we got a hold of Vegetarian Times magazine, yeah. which talked about the uh, food factories of how the slaughterhouses. And I had never heard that information, and it made me a vegetarian right away. And say, same with Steve. Yeah. So that was in the first uh, few months of our. Now, the mucusless diet healing system, Steve didn't get that book until two years later. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. I think after we had gone to and 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 the funny thing is, well, mm -hmm. I could tell you another uh, yeah. anecdote. But anyway, so the, the mucusless diet healing system mm -hmm. was why we were going up to the farm and we fasted on apples which is a fruitarian diet oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. for a week yeah. and which is kind of where the name apple came from because we yeah. were eating nothing but apple uh, yeah <laughs> okay so okay. i would say there were a variety of reasons yeah okay i see and the next question and uh, what do you think about jobs how do you feel well 
uh, Steve and I both took the calligraphy course. Oh, week, really? And it was a very, yeah. But we weren't in the same class. But yeah. we, because there were multiple sessions. Yeah. But um, it was a very meaningful class for me. Yeah. And uh, as a class exercise, everybody had to pick a passage and make their own book with wow. calligraphy in their own and um, I don't know what Steve did for his class project. Yeah. Maybe he didn't do one. Yeah. But um, the guy who taught the calligraphy class mm -hmm. was uh, very charismatic and everybody liked him. Now, mm -hmm. that picture you're showing is of Boyd Reynolds, mm -hmm. who had, oh, you know. who I think, had already passed away mm -hmm. by the time we took calligraphy. Yeah. But I'll just add one more comment. Mm -hmm. When Steve said, many decades later, mm -hmm. if he hadn't studied calligraphy, the mm -hmm. Macintosh wouldn't have adjustable fonts. That yeah, was yeah. a ridiculous, ridiculous <laughs> thing. Of course it would have had adjustable fonts. It was a graphics computer. Yeah. But Steve <laughs> likes to say, you know, mm -hmm. important things like that. So <laughs> I'm sure it helped. I'm sure it did help him appreciate calligraphy. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's worth mentioning that part of the charm of Reed College was that all the signs that were all over campus about events they were all beautiful. All the signs on campus were in calligraphy, and sadly, yeah. now listen. Okay, I have to tell you another story. Did Steve ever give money to Reed College? No. Now <laughs> they ended. They yeah. ended the program at Reed because it was too expensive oh. and I was I was at a Reed reunion yeah. the year before it died and everybody was complaining about they were in calligraphy at Reed and I said all right all right I'm gonna take the responsibility I'm gonna call Steve up and shame him <laughs> into paying for a calligraphy professor yeah. but then he died and I never that's a good story, right? Uh, yeah, thank you. And the next, well, uh, tell us about Robert Greenberg. The film jumps was very uh, influenced at Will College. Uh, he is said to be the origin of Jobs Harvestina, uh, reality and social field. What do you think of it? That's a very good question, Toshi. Yeah. Now, you you also have a very good photo of Robert. I don't know where you found that, but he never looked like that. <laughs> yeah. Robert, Robert had very long hair down to his yeah. shoulders. This next, um, is that right? That's a photo from the farm. Mm, yeah. And there's Steve, and to the left of Steve is my girlfriend, Elizabeth. Oh, your friend. And your girlfriend, yeah. And the little girl in the photo is yeah. Robert Friedland's daughter. Oh, oh yeah. That's his daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, Steve's daughter was born at that farm. Yes. No, she did, wasn't born at the farm, but as soon as she was born, Chris Ann, the mother, took Lisa and went up and lived at that farm for six months. Yeah. Because it was a very supportive. Those were all friends of mine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, to answer the question, um, Robert Friedland was a very charismatic person. Yeah. And I don't know his life history. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he got that way. Mm -hmm. Usually in life, to be charismatic in that way, he mm -hmm. must have learned it from someone when he was younger, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. an uncle or a parent or somebody. Mm -hmm. He was so sure of himself and so enthusiastic about things mm -hmm. and always in charge. Mm -hmm. And the first year at Reed College, he ran for student body president and he won. Mm -hmm. so he was the student body president. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how we knew him. We just knew him from around campus. Mm -hmm. But when the subject of Be Here Now came up, it turned out that he was at he was in the book. Mm. He was in the Here Now book. And he had been in India and part of Ram Dass's entourage. Mm -hmm. And so he was very, very much responsible for us going to India because he mm. gave us the contacts. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Now, 
as to the question about reality distortion field, mm. that made me laugh. <laughs> I, uh, I heard a story once about who coined that term. Yeah. And I can't remember who it was now, but it wasn't Robert. However, yeah. mm -hmm. I would say that Robert had his own reality distortion field, <laughs> right? Yeah. In the same way that um, many charismatic people, if they're politicians mm -hmm. or CEOs, very successful people, especially successful narcissistic people, mm -hmm. they're so convinced of what they're doing that they distort the reality. <laughs> okay? Okay. So, we, it's a, it's a, anyway, it was an important part of Steve's personality, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the next question is, do you think the emperor, uh, do you think the stands at the hippie commune, the upper garden, all one firm, influence the company name and the organization of upper computer? Good. Uh, people don't usually call it a hippie commune, but mm -hmm. it's fair to say it was a hippie commune. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, definitely the name. Mm. It was clearly the source of the name Apple, mm. because that was only a year later. Mm. And our uh, um, my girlfriend Elizabeth mm -hmm. in the photo there, she was living at the All One Farm, mm -hmm. and um, we had many happy times there. Steve spent more time there than I did. Mm. I was there for two weeks, maybe. And Steve might have gone back other times. He probably did. Mm. Anyway, as for the organization, I don't think so. I see. Now, when when Apple first started, Steve uh, Steve Wozniak had nothing to do with the organization. He was purely an engineer. Steve Jobs didn't even have a clear job. Yeah. He was vice president of operations. I think is his title. But Mike Scott was the president, and he ran Apple with a very firm hand. He had been a um, president at National Semiconductor, and he was an experienced CEO. So he is the one who set all the policies of Apple. I see. Thank you. And next question. And in 1974, Jones returned home and worked for Atari. And uh, meanwhile, you transferred to Columbia University. Why? <laughs> uh, very good question. Yeah. So I, uh, I was interested in electronics, but I had no background in electronics. And so I was not a candidate to work at Atari. And in fact, Steve brought me to Atari in 1976 and helped me fill out an application but they didn't hire me because I didn't have any background. Hmm. I, um, I didn't know, so I dropped out of Reed mm -hmm. because I thought I wanted to major in music and Reed had a very weak music oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I had That's no cool. other problem, I liked Reed, mm -hmm. but it, Reed was very uh, academically uh, rigorous and at Reed you had to join a department by your junior year and you had to write a big thesis mm -hmm. and I didn't really think I wanted to write a thesis <laughs> but I, I liked learning mm -hmm. and I grew up quite close to New York City yeah. and so um, after we got back from India mm -hmm. my parents wanted me out of the house mm -hmm. and uh, and I wanted to go back to college, so, uh, but I didn't know where to go, and I ended up going to Columbia because a very good friend of mine was yeah. at Columbia, and he offered to share his dorm room with me. Okay. So I, it's hard to find a dorm room in New York City. Right? Uh, yeah, that's a very important thing. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I would like it at Columbia, but I, I moved into my friend's, I enrolled in the School of General Studies, which is mm -hmm. easy to apply for, and then I started going there, but I liked it. So mm -hmm. then I applied to Columbia College, and I graduated with music and literature as yeah, my yeah. major. Yeah. Do you write, maybe you like, you love music. Uh, do you play some instrument? I play you the play? piano. Oh. I am not 
a gifted piano player because yeah. I started very late. Yeah. I did not start as a child. Mm. Um, but I always wanted to play rock and roll, and now I can. <laughs> and I play Beatles songs, and I play Bob Dylan, yeah. and uh, popular music. Yeah, good, thank you. Well, the next question. Uh, in 1974, you and Jobs traveled to India. What kind of trip was that? Did you get the enlightenment? <laughs> Good question you're asking. I like these questions. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, so Neem Karoli, who you're showing his photo, mm -hmm. he had already passed away. Yes. The main reason we were going to India was to go to the Kumbha Mela, mm -hmm. which is a huge religious gathering. The Kumbha mm -hmm. Mela had, uh, even back then, it was 50 million people. And now it's over hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Steve was supposed to wait in New Delhi for me to arrive and we were going to go to the Kumbh Mela, but he was a little selfish and he didn't want to wait. So he went ahead before I arrived and he went to the Kumbh Mela for one day. He got sick and left. Yeah. And so I never got to go. So I was disappointed. Yeah. Other than that, if you ask what kind of trip it was, well, we didn't really have a plan. We had a list of places, or rather Steve had a list of places that Robert had given him. Mm -hmm. So we went to many temples. Mm -hmm. We did not see many gurus. We really only saw one guru, mm -hmm. and that was Harakan Baba, and mm -hmm. he was not really impressed. Mm -hmm. However, when Steve later in his biography, Steve said that Harakan Baba was a charlatan. I think that's very unfair. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was a charlatan. <laughs> he was an Indian guru. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't have to do miracles to be a guru. You could just, it's like being a, 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 a rabbi or a sensei, right? Mm. Anyway, mm. Did, no, we did not get enlightenment. Mm -hmm. well, but. How, uh, how, how long did you stay in India? Um, I stayed a full four months. Mm -hmm. Steve stayed only three and a half months. Mm -hmm. He, uh, for some reason, he his return ticket was sooner than mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last month, so we were together for three months. Mm -hmm. And the last month, I was completely on my own, mm -hmm. uh, which wouldn't have been my choice, but I was comfortable. Mm -hmm. And and I went up to northern India. I went to Srinagar in Kashmir. And I went to Dalhousie, mm -hmm. and I took three 10-day Vipassana meditation retreats, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was a very formative influence on my life. Mm -hmm. And although I wouldn't call that enlightenment, it is, Vipassana has now become very popular, mm -hmm. especially in the modern world when everyone has problems with stress, yes. right? Yeah. Vipassana is very good for stress. Yeah. I would say, unlike Zazen, Zazen has its uses, but it doesn't really teach you to relax. You have to actively relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, Steve never knew about Vipassana. Mm -hmm. And once I came back from India, mm -hmm. he was so busy starting Apple Computer, yeah. he didn't really want to hear mm -hmm. about Vipassana. Mm -hmm. He was more busy with computers. Yeah. It's so, a, on the subject of enlightenment, it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm trying to write my own memoir, oh, yeah. realize that mm -hmm. my trip to India with Steve was about two yen searching for enlightenment in India. That is mm -hmm. the theme. Mm -hmm. And realize that I can't, like if I'm going to write the memoir, Mm -hmm. I have to define what I mean by enlightenment by the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And that's a big job, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've been pondering that for the last year, and I think I've come up with some good ideas, yeah. which I'll save for the next. Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll tell you about that when I write the book. <laughs> it's very uh, interesting. You said that you, uh, you learned about Jax, relaxation, and jobs don't run. Relaxation. 
that's a, that's a problem. So yes, yeah. So so he shortened his life. <laughs> his life is shortened because of hard work, <laughs> that's right? Uh, that's, I can't. I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Okay, uh, I said that uh, you you learn about relaxation. Yes. Steve Jobs doesn't. Didn't. Steve did not. Well, Steve, Steve and I both did a lot of zazen meditation, mm -hmm. which is not really about relaxation. Mm. It's about it's about emptiness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then uh, after uh, India trip, Joe went to hike Zendel in Los Alpes. Uh, how do you think? Jobs from Hikazendu. That's a very good question. I don't know. Mm. Um, I don't know, although he definitely knew what Zen was and he knew he was interested in it. And mm. so I, I think he may have just learned by word of mouth. Mm. He was very quick to pick things up and he talked to a lot of people. Mm. And so um, he just heard about it from someone. I mean, he had a girl, Chris Ann was his girlfriend, and she used to go to the Zendo also. Maybe she knew about it before he did. Wow. It could have been a number of things. And uh, I think it's a, myth, a miracle, a uh, karma. A uh, believer uh, named Marion Dury, uh, who lives in this artist. Right, renovated her uh, home garage uh, in Haikuzendo for Shinju City. Didn't you know that? that that's the excellent. Yeah. And, uh, and she recorded the stories of Shinju Suzuki, who had a short life uh, due to the cancer. Uh, right. Pub pub published them mine, Vigna's uh, mine in 1970, and he died in 1971. And Jobs entered the Reed College in 1972, after yes. he died, and returned home in Los Alpes in 1974. The yes. priest of Haiku Zendo came to Hovuncino, whom Shunri Suzuki called from Eihei. Okay. And this is a route from Job's home to Hike Zendo. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> and Kobunchino said, oh, said Job uh, uh, often came barefoot. Did you work there? Uh, did, you, uh, did you also uh, practice Zazen in Hike Zendo? Uh, what's your impression of Kobunchino? Good questions. Yeah. I like your, I like your map. No, it was too far to walk from Steve's house. Mm -hmm. We never walked. Yeah. Um, Steve had an old green Volvo that we used to drive everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yes, he often went barefoot. Yeah. Uh, especially into the Zendo. I I don't know if there's a tradition of going barefoot in Zendos or not, but. Uh, Steve and I both like to go barefoot, although you can't go barefoot in India, you'll burn your feet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> in fact, I, I saved Steve, I saved, uh, I say, I don't know, I didn't save his life, but um, when Steve and I went to go this to this ashram in India, we were hiking, it did a five mile long hike through a burning hot riverbed that was filled with stones and steve lost his sandal in the river yeah. it came off his foot mm -hmm. and i saw it go by mm -hmm. and i thought oh my god that'll be a disaster because you can't you can't walk barefoot yeah and so i went running i went running down the river and i caught his sandal for him <laughs> i saved him he should have been grateful <laughs> Anyway, uh, my impression of Coben was, was I liked him very much. He mm -hmm. was a very kind and thoughtful man. 
-hmm. And um, of course, Steve really sought him out as a mentor mm -hmm. to quite an extensive degree. Steve was always looking for mentors mm -hmm. in various aspects of his life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why he was close to Coben, and Coben married him when Steve got married. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, that was very sad that Coben died so young mm -hmm. by drowning, trying to save his daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer answer the other question, yes, we Steve and I did zazen at the Haiku Zendo many times, maybe twice a week. Is this photo uh, uh, Haiku Zendo the center? This photo, is this photo Haiku Zendo or not other place? And uh, do you understand? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, center photo, three photos, center photo. Is this Haiku Zendo? I, did you, I don't know if you asked me that before. I don't remember. I don't remember sitting up on uh, mm -hmm. Blocks. I remember sitting on the floor. Yeah, we are floor. Yeah. <laughs> but they could have added those raised platforms later. Well, this is a uh, uh, Kovunchino's video, and uh, also a mountain. Please uh, look at this. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, first, uh, uh, about the whistle, uh, the third of whistle and job. Uh, just firmly refused to legalize whistle as a tag. Name new machine whistle. How do you think about it? That's a good photo of Chris Ann. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was uh, completely inexplicable that Steve just refused to recognize Lisa as his child. Mm -hmm. And um, there is some dispute over the origin of the computer project mm -hmm. named Lisa. Mm -hmm. The Apple III Mm. With code named Sarah, because mm. that was the daughter of Wendell Sander, who was in charge of the Apple III. Yeah. Now, Steve was meddling too much in the Apple III, mm. and they asked him to leave the project. So, he, Steve was in favor of starting the Lisa project, mm -hmm. but I'm not completely sure he named it. Mm. And there is a rumor mm -hmm. that the people who okay so the lisa project was um a whole group of older engineers that apple had hired from hewlett packard and sri and xerox park okay and um 
although Steve started that project, he wasn't running it. Hmm. And so I, um, there is a theory that they named it Lisa to tease Steve hmm. because the earlier computer was named after the other guy's daughter also. Hmm. And I don't know that that's true or not. Some people dispute it. It, I, I do agree it's, it makes little sense that he would name the computer Lisa if he was denying that he was the father. Mm. It doesn't make sense to me. Mm. I was uh, not living with him anymore at the time that happened. Mm. Steve and I were living together from 77 to the end of 79, mm. and the Lisa project uh, started in 1980. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. I can't tell you anymore. Okay. And you are cut from yourself when you answer yes to the question, is Lisa a child of job by time management? I thought that jobs was bad. How do you feel at the time? Oh, at the time, I felt very bad. <laughs> I, uh, I did not even know why he was so mad at me. Yeah. And he didn't. I really did not know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I figured it had something to do with his privacy about his daughter. Yeah. But he never told me that he was keeping that a secret. That's right. That's right. If he had told me, of course I would have done as he wished, but he never even said that. Mm -hmm. So it took years before one of the journalists told me yeah. oh he was mad at you because you violated his privacy and yeah. he thought he was going to be on the cover of time magazine yeah. anyway that wasn't true either. so it was kind of a big misunderstanding and it was very yeah. unfortunate <laughs> yeah you're well, very unfortunate i think so yeah and uh, yeah in march uh, 1991 joe murray wrote in poem the priest was calling to him. He uh, decided uh, to date with him and he also date this new uh, Lennon uh, How do you think about it? Okay, well, first of all, you've got Lorene's name wrong. It's L-A-U-R-E-N-E. -E. I'm sorry. I'm and I don't, I don't know Lorene very well. I've met her a few times. Mm -hmm. I liked her, but she was very guarded with mm -hmm. me. I think she was afraid that anything she said to me, I would, you know, <laughs> say it press, right? Um, but he did not decide to raise Lisa at all. And um, he did not give Chris Anna a fortune. He was not <laughs> kind to he, What he did do, well, Chris Anna had to sue him twice for child support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twice. Like, he, she sued him once, and he lost, and then he still didn't pay it, so she had to sue him again. That is so dishonorable. Yeah. It's really embarrassing. Yeah. Anyway, what he did do is he bought her a nice house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A nice house in, yeah. Palo, uh, in Palo Alto. Mm. I never visited it, but I knew where it was. It was a nice house. Mm. And what did she – well, then when Lisa was about 13 – Mm -hmm. Chris, okay, 13-year-old, I was very rebellious when I was 13. I think Lisa was also. Mm -hmm. And she was starting to get in arguments with her mother. And it was Lisa who said, screw you, I'm going to live with my dad. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that was just about in 1991 or 1992. If she was, maybe she was, it was probably 1992. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um very much to Lorene's credit, because Steve was working all the time. To Lorene's credit, she took Lisa in and treated her pretty well. Not super well. You can read, Le you can read Lisa's autobiography. I she see. didn't really feel well cared for, but I, I think Lorene gets a lot of credit because it could have been, a, it was a complicated situation. Anyway, um, Chrisanne, I think, is not well taken care of, no, but Lisa is wealthy. Lisa, Lisa has been well provided for, and I think Lisa will be taking care of her mother. No, 
I have the next question. Uh, uh, did you know uh, that Jobs chose after one vote to volunteer, <laughs> telling that it was evidence of writing at that time? <laughs> what did he <you> think <laughs> I'm laughing. I never heard that. I think that's very funny. I, yeah. Where did you hear that? Where did you learn that? Yeah, uh, 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 at the book of uh, uh, recent uh, published by uh, Nagida san The book uh, about uh, Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Oh, which which I haven't read yet. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I have to read it now. Yeah. And in the well, um, I, can, I, I can believe Steve said that, and it's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, kind of it. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's just, it's just technology. All the technology in the world doesn't help people be enlightened. Come on. Enlightened, yeah. Eve, right? And you, and Jobs and there was Yank have founded Apple Computer Work Inc. on April 4th, 1972. And you built yes. a test the Apple One in Jobs' own knowledge. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I would say to ask what it was like, um, the number one thing to say is that Steve's parents were so supportive. Mm -hmm. He had really good parents, Paul and Clara, and they made me welcome the first day I showed up, and I spent the entire summer sleeping on the couch in their living room, okay? They didn't have a big house. In fact, that window that you see there, that window in the picture, I was sleeping on the couch just inside that window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were so helpful. I mean, they should get credit for Apple Computer starting because they could have easily not been so supportive. Mm -hmm. And um, other than that, I would say it was very quiet. The, nothing much was happening. There were these computer boards. They weren't that exciting. Yeah. In order to understand how exciting the Apple One was, you had to know a lot more about the computer business, and I didn't. I didn't know much about it at all. Mm -hmm. I knew that Atari mm -hmm. was very successful, mm -hmm. and Steve had brought me over to Atari, but that was the world of games. Mm -hmm. And to look at the Apple One, it was slow. Oh, it was Calotype. Mm -hmm. It was only 30 characters a second. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was hard to imagine that it could ever be a game machine like an Atari. It really couldn't. It was way too slow. Yeah. Um, and in fact, if uh, you know, the Apple II was far more exciting. Yes. And of course, it was a huge success. Mm -hmm. So anyway, from my point of view, that summer, most of the time, I was the only person in the garage. Mm -hmm. Steve spent more of his time. I'm in the kitchen talking on the phone. Wow, yeah. He was on calls. He was yeah. on the phone all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he often went out with his car and left me home alone. Yeah. So I was I was there alone yeah. testing computers. And if wow. the phone rang, I had to run into the kitchen and answer the phone and take a message. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, 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 and I spent all my... I, no. I spent the rest of my time mm -hmm. reading computer magazines and reading the 6502 instruction manual to try and understand how the computer worked. And to be quite honest, I didn't know how it worked. <laughs> I did. I couldn't fix them, but I could test them. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, hey, here are the photo of you and Jobs uh, showing the upper one uh, at the PC 76 computer show. In Grand New Jersey, uh, you were uh, the left side long-haired man for the job, right? Yes, that's true. <laughs> and the reason I look so serious in that photo mm -hmm. is because people were so at that computer show. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were were not standing by the computer; they were out walking around, learning yeah. about all the other. So I'm the one who was standing there all day <laughs> showing the computer and people would ask me technical questions that yeah, I didn't yeah. know the answer to. <laughs> so I was trying to look yeah. serious and um, 
because I didn't really know much about computers. I could only answer the question. So if you look on the table, if you go back to that photo, on the table there is the flyer that Steve and I wrote about the Apple One and how it worked. And not how it worked, but what its capabilities were. And that was all I knew. So I could, I had that memorized. I could tell what the features were. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. The next question. I'm glad to hey, you joined at the, at the firm's uh, full-time employee and uh, were involved in the development of Apple II, Apple III, and Macintosh. What role did you play? Oh, I love this question. Mm. So, <laughs> well, as you know, I didn't have a, I didn't really study electronics yep. at all. I never studied computers. I never studied uh, digital electronics. I took one course in transistor theory mm. at Columbia. That was it. <laughs> But there really weren't any transistors in that, you know, not many transistors. I didn't know much about chips. So the whole first year I was at Apple, I was just fixing Apple II boards. Wow. And it turned out I was very good at it hmm. because you didn't have to know really how the chips worked because most of the time when the Apple II failed, it was a bent pin or a bad connection and you just had to have sharp eyes and be um, look carefully and find the problems. And I was good at that. And mm -hmm. so then I moved into the engineering lab and I spent six months building uh, prototype um, accessory cards for the Apple II mm -hmm. because there were a lot of engineers at Apple and I was the technician and I could build anything anybody wanted. I didn't have to know how to design things. I could just build it. Mm -hmm. And then I got a great job mm -hmm. uh, being the uh, technician to build all the prototypes of the Apple III. Mm -hmm. And the Apple III was a, a fantastic project. It was basically an Apple II with mm -hmm. all of the improvements that everybody had asked for. So it was a very complicated machine. It was actually quite comparable to the IBM PC. When the IBM PC came out, we took it apart immediately and were comparing it with the Apple III and they were quite close in mm -hmm. comparison. Um, but of course, Apple couldn't really compete with IBM in sales and service. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, and then um, uh, Steve was nice enough to hire me onto the Macintosh project in January of 1981 yeah. And I say nice, he didn't have to, although I was the best technician in the company. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And the Burl Smith was the designer of the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. And Burl Smith gets a huge amount of credit. He's a, a kind of a genius the way Waz was. And, but Burl was not really, didn't have the patience for building things and debugging things. He was a great designer. And so I built the majority of the Macintosh prototypes. Oh. <laughs> uh, probably uh, six or eight, built wow. them by hand with wire out. Yeah. And then there were a dozen different versions of the PC board of the Macintosh before we shipped it. Mm -hmm. And I built all of them and debugged wow. them. I was very good at that. And then I was also the designer of the detached keyboard that you see in the photo. So that was an embedded computer, and that was my design, uh, mm -hmm. and I was quite proud of that. Mm -hmm. The sun has gone down, so I'm going to add more light here. There we go, a little more light. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyway, I was a designer on the Macintosh. Oh, that's great. And the uh, question is that uh, you were involved in the development of the, the, the hydrocarbon. Uh, it was Alan K. who advised that to be programmed. Did you know it? And how this body uh, paper problem? Okay. okay, to clarify, I was not involved in HyperCard at all. Mm -hmm. Now, I left Apple at the end of 1984. HyperCard, uh, Bill Atkinson started to write HyperCard, I think in 1986, mm -hmm. 1985, 1986. Mm -hmm. I don't think it came out until. 86. Mm. I'm 
not sure exactly when it came out. Probably 86, possibly 87, right? Mm -hmm. However, it was also a big success, and it was a big factor in the success of the Macintosh because it was graphically oriented. Yeah. And um, I was a big fan of HyperCard, and many of my friends, and of course I was a friend of Bill Atkinson, and I loved Bill. Everybody loved Bill. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you want Bill to give you a talk about HyperCard, I will help you. I'll help set that up for you. He'll give a talk for you. Anyway, um, because Bill wrote the quick draw routines that were the graphic primitive routines for the Macintosh, HyperCard was uh, a very logical outgrowth of his work. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of work, but mm -hmm. it, it wasn't as much work as it seems because he, all, he knew all the graphics routines very well. Mm -hmm. And he had... Um, Susan Kerr doing yeah. all the icons. That's a lot of work. And Susan, yeah. uh, Susan um, right. Right. maybe Susan will give a talk for you. She lives in San oh, Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not super good friends with her, but I'll call her up for you. Anyway, um, there were in the late '80s, mm -hmm. HyperCard was hugely popular. Mm -hmm. It was the most popular mm -hmm. thing, except possibly for desktop thing, right? Mm -hmm. But um, many, many of my friends in the Bay Area were HyperCard stack designers. Yeah. And um, I'm just a fan of HyperCard. And now that I'm in the smart home field, as I told you earlier, I'm thinking smart homes are so complicated, people have to customize their own homes. And that's a very difficult thing. So why not use something like HyperCard mm -hmm. as a front end? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. And Andy Hertzfeld thought that was a good idea. So I have to have lunch with him again. Mm -hmm. Alan Kay now. Alan Kay, another genius. We loved Alan Kay. Mm -hmm. Al I was there when the Lisa group hired Alan Kay to come and talk mm -hmm. about computer graphics. Mm -hmm. And I was just completely, I was still a, a, a young engineer and, and I was just in awe of Alan Kay. Mm -hmm. He was so smart. Yeah. <laughs> we all loved Alan. Yeah. yeah. He later became an Apple fellow. Yeah. Of course. Okay. And my last question, why did Steve Jobs become the man who changed the world. Uh, this video is a scene of what you were talking about jealousy. <coughs> the man changed the world. Uh, Steve Jobs, uh, broadcasted by NHK in uh, 2011, when Jobs died. I can't hear it. Ah, uh, yeah, the Japanese Japanese. <laughs> okay. And you said in this video, uh, he continued to suffer from being abandoned by young uh, biological parents. So uh, uh, he became a uh, hippie, uh, went to the uh, commune, and uh, wandered around India. And he met them with uh, Provencino. What do you think of uh, the en uh, encounter with Zen and uh, Haiti Zen meant for Joe? I never knew that Coben's name was Hirofumi. Hmm. Coben, is it Coben is his title? Uh, no, I thought Chino was his title. Yeah, uh, his name is, his full name is Coben, you know Coben in Japanese. Coben is his name. Okay. okay? Well, I think, uh, what do you think the encounter? Well, I think, I think meeting Coben was very important for Steve because after reading all, all these books about enlightenment, Steve thought he was enlightened. And, you know, whether he was or not, it all depends on what definition. He was obviously very smart and he had exposed himself to many, many ideas. And so that is a type of enlightenment mm -hmm. right there. Just to be a, a person who knows a lot about the world is wisdom is a type of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Coben was a very humble man, I would say. If you asked Coben 
Clinton, whether he was in love, he would just make a joke. He would laugh about it. I, I don't think he would answer that question, right? Mm -hmm. That's just my guess. Anyway, I think it. I think Coben was very helpful to Steve in his life because he was kind of like a father figure who represented part of what Steve aspired to. Now, Steve's adoptive father, Paul Jobs, was a wonderful man in, in every way. But he wasn't, he was from Oklahoma. He was a very down to earth person, not mystical at all. And so Coben represented a, a, a mentor that Steve was very much looking for. I see. I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah. And 1986, I first met Macintosh. And I was very uh, impressed uh, how cute it was. Uh, before Mac, computers were just machines. I think Mac, uh, Mac fits out Japanese very much. And what do you think about the uh, uh, attractivity of Apple, com Apple product? And what do you think about the relation between Japanese culture and Apple, Apple product? Um, uh, attractivity of Apple products in general, well, uh, Steve, Steve was had a, an aptitude for design, mm -hmm. clearly, which I never saw in him early on, I, not, at, not in the Reed College years, not in the trip to India. And I'm not sure exactly when that developed, but Steve had a lot to do with the design of the Apple II, mm -hmm. but he didn't actually design the machine. Jerry Manick designed the machine. Mm -hmm. Steve was extremely involved in the design of the Macintosh and wanting it to be friendly, but mm -hmm. a, I, of course, you could also give a lot of the credit to Jeff Raskin, who actually started the Macintosh project, right? Now, uh, about the relation between Japanese culture, I'm not so sure. I, I don't really know because I've never been to Japan myself, and oh, I, don't know, well. I don't know that much about Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that Steve had immense... Uh, regard and respect for Sony and Akio Morita mm -hmm. and Sony products, the Walkman. Mm -hmm. Sony really completely dominated uh, portable electronics in those days yeah. and they had very good time. Mm -hmm. So I think that contributed a lot to Steve's design sense. That's just Sony. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. And then, of course, just to finish that question, once Johnny, Johnny Ive, Steve was so lucky to have Johnny Ive. Johnny Ive was uh, a huge contributor to all of Apple's design. Because his, to, to do that, you, you have to be a, Steve, Steve was good at picking what he liked, but Johnny Ive was really the designer mm. of all of those great products. Mm. Now, who was the designer of the next? I don't know. But the next really was a failure for hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, it, people have people praise the design of the next, but it was way way overpriced, and that's why it failed. It mm -hmm. could have been a lot more successful at half the price. Yeah. It didn't have to be made out of magnesium, for God's sakes. Anyway, <laughs> next question. Yes, that's no, it's a perfect question. Icy coldness, very true. Mm -hmm. Kind of. I don't know about abnormal. There's a lot of icy cold people in the world, but uh, his swearing, well, I don't think that was the main thing, but he was often cruel to people, to put it yeah. bluntly. Uh, but, but he still became a man who changed the world. He advanced mankind. Well, listen, you can say the same things about Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. You can say the same things about Henry Ford. Yeah. They were both very difficult man in person okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and did Steve even know that I don't think he knew that yeah. I, think, I think Steve uh, uh, well mm -hmm. what just the reasons why he's a man who changed the world he was in the same way that Bill Gates mm -hmm. Bill, you know 
Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were both immensely talented and also immensely lucky to arrive at that point in history where they could be on the ground floor of the gigantic revolution of technology. And those giant revolutions don't happen that often. Mm -hmm. um, same with Steve Wozniak. I mean, Steve Wozniak, he was not an entrepreneur. He loved his job at Hewlett Packard and he didn't want to quit Hewlett Packard, but he, he had a type of mind that was just pouring out innovations, mm -hmm. but he would not have started a company. Yeah. And Steve Jobs was um, um, uh, per, uh, realized that there was a huge opportunity here. Yeah. And I think partly because of his experience at Atari. I think Steve learned a lot from Nolan Bushnell. Yeah. Nolan Bushnell was not an electrical engineer, but he, he put together this video game and it became a huge success. And so Steve r rightly realized that he could kind of follow the same path. And this, this is your button. <laughs> this is a uh, quick video. It was cool. You love music, literature, technology, and the liberal arts. It's similar to job. What does job meant to you? And what does it mean to mankind? Oh my gosh, the tough questions. <laughs> uh, let's see, that photo was taken at the wedding of a friend of mine. That's why I'm kind of dressed up. And I didn't take it. And in fact, I thought that photo looked strange because in fact, it's flipped left to right. Yeah. And, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. um, it was my friend Greg Panos who took that photo and he put it on. He's the one who my Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah. And he put the photo on the Wikipedia page, which yeah. is now taken off. But anyway, it's a nice photo. Mm. Now, what Steve Jobs means to me, of course, is uh, he was a very good force in my life and also a very traumatic force in my life. And so. Uh, like many people's lives, it's a balance of things that are positive and negative. Yeah. If I ask myself what would have happened in my life if I had never met Steve, that's yeah. a, I can't even answer that question. I yeah. don't know. But Steve was my best friend in college. Yeah. He shared interest in so many things. Yeah. I am very grateful that he was my friend, even just to be college and to go to India with, even if Apple had never happened. Yeah. So, you know, what Steve said is if Apple hadn't happened, his next plan was to go to Japan and become a monk. He yeah. said that. He probably said that many times. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I believe him, though. No. I don't know. I don't think I believe that. Because the electronics revolution was already happening, and mm -hmm. Steve was close enough the Watari, which was wildly successful, he knew there were great fortunes to be made. It was pretty clear. Yeah. So, and he was smart enough to be able to not lose his place on the on the road to technology. Mm -hmm. So, if you ask what jobs means to mankind, that's another huge question. I, <laughs> the really big question that I was asking for years because Steve was so much more successful than anyone I had ever known. And, uh, and he, he treated so many people badly, not just me. And we would ask, well, like, is, do you have to behave badly in order to be so successful? Is there, right? Was yeah. that necessary? Yeah. And the truth of it is, once Apple became very successful, mm -hmm. Steve was competing to stay on in charge at Apple, competing with men that were many years older than him, men who had much more experience. Yeah. And so he really had to fight to stay on top. Yeah. And as, as you know, he lost. He, got, he basically got his budget taken away from him in 1986, mm -hmm. 1985, and left Apple. He wasn't fired, but he left because they took his budget away. And without a budget, he would have just been an advisor. Mm -hmm. And um, what was I going with that? If you ask what he means to mankind, the question is, um, you know, here in Silicon Valley where I live, there are 
nonstop books coming out and workshops and meetups about how to be a good leader, right? In my world, it's just nonstop. How to be a good leader. So many books, so many books. And um, I think we can say at this point, no. You, uh, in fact, there's a book, I love the title, um, uh, The No Bullshit Rule, right? There's a book called The No Bull Bullshit Rule or something like that. Yeah. And I, I thoroughly approve of that, um, of that idea that, no, you can still be wildly successful and be a good person. Now, uh, and there's plenty of cases of that in the, in the world. But there's also ca many cases of bad behavior, but there's many cases of good behavior, right? So, uh, anyway... Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a theme that I will have to write a little chapter in when I write my memoir. Okay, thank thank you very much. A very long interview and uh, please really. Uh, <laughs>